Kia ora, and welcome to the evening edition of Mathematics with Richard. Last video, we looked at systems of linear equations. So there are a couple of things that I'd like you to remember uh, before we move on. So firstly, a little study with planes told us that when we have a system of linear equations, we should expect that there are a few different possibilities that might come up in terms of their solution. So we might find that there is a single solution, or we might find that there's no solution at all, like if two of the planes were parallel, or we might find that there are infinitely many solutions. These are all things that we should naturally expect to come across. So we should be on the lookout uh, for these situations coming up as we develop our methodology. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to develop a systematic way of combining equations together to make simpler ones. For example, if I have two equations 3x plus 3y equals 7 and negative 3x minus y equals 1, then you can see that if we add these two equations together by adding their left and right hand sides, the new equation will have no x terms in it. So I'll get 3x plus, minus 3x is 0x, 3y minus 2y is, uh, 3y minus y is 2y, and 7 plus 1 is 8 on the right hand side. So what we do is see that y equals 4, um, and then we go and plug this back into our first equation to solve for y. This is pretty much the back substitution that we did last video. But our aim is actually to transform our system of equations into that form and then do back substitution. So if we were to write down a new full system of equations that captured what it was that we just did, it would look like 3x plus 3y equals 7 and 2y equals 8. So notice that we've kept the first equation because otherwise we wouldn't be able to get both x and y. So a slightly more, I guess, high level way of thinking about what we just did is that we did a transformation of our system, we replace the second equation, 2, with the sum of the first and second, 1 plus 2. So we could write this as equation 2 is replaced with equation 1 plus equation 2. And let's have a look at what this would look like with our augmented matrices. So we could write our system down as the augmented matrix 3, 3, 7, negative 3, negative 1, 1. And then the operation we did is we replace row 2 with row 2 plus row 1, so we write that as R2 goes to R2 plus R1. And then we just write down the new matrix, which is 3, 3, 7, 0, negative 2, 8. So we can think of what we just did as, re as replacing row 2 with the sum of row 2 and row 1. Okay, so if we work this way with our matrices, we don't need to keep writing our equations down. We can just do the arithmetic on the rows of the matrix. Right, so let's set up some ground rules. The thing that is 100% crucial is that when we're messing around with our equations, it's really important that we don't mess our solution up by doing these operations. And it turns out that if we restrict ourselves to three particular what we call elementary row operations, then we're guaranteed to keep the solution to our system intact. So these operations are row swap, and we write that one as ri with our left and right arrow, rj. This one swaps rows i and j around. So for example, if we've got the matrix 0, 2, 3, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 1, 2, and 3, 0 0.56 minus 3, we might want to swap rows 1 and 3. It's just reordering the equations, so the new matrix would be 3, 0 0.56, negative 3, 0, negative 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3, negative 1. Now the second of our three operations is scalar multiplication, where row i goes to a times row i for some non-zero a. This one multiplies row i with a non-zero scalar, and for example, if we go back to our same system again, this time we're going to multiply row 1 by a third, and we'll get our matrix will become 1, 1 sixth, now it's a third of a half, um, 2, it's a third of 6, and, and then negative 1, and then the next two rows are going to stay the same. So we multiplied row 1 by a third to turn that 3 into a 1. And the third of our elementary row operations is, for lack of a better term, times row plus. So you take row i and you add onto it a scalar a times row j. So if you can think of a better name for it, by all means use that. So again, sticking with the same example, this time we're going to add on a multiple of row 2 onto row 3. So we write this as row 3 goes to row 3 plus 2 row 2. The first two rows are going to stay the same. And then the third row becomes 0, because uh, it's 2 plus 2 lots of negative 1 is 0. Then it's 5 um, plus 2 lots, uh, sorry, 3 plus 2 lots of 1, which gives us a 5. And then we get negative 1 plus 2 lots of 2, which gives us 3. 
So notice what we did there was to replace row 3 by row 3 plus 2 times row 2. And we could write that down explicitly off to one side in case it wasn't clear exactly what happened just then. So row 3 was 0, 2, 3, negative 1. Then we're adding on two row twos, which is two lots of 0, negative 1, 1, 2. Add those together, row 3 plus 2 row 2 is equal to 0, 0, 5, negative 3. Okay, so notice in our example, in the example I just gave you, we actually started off with an augmented matrix and reduced it to our upper triangular form. That's the form we need to do back substitution. So that's pretty cool. Now I haven't really taught you this method yet, but you can see that these row operations can actually work to give us something nice like this. So let's just recap really quickly. The three elementary row operations are the row swap, ri is swapped with row j. The scalar multiplication, ri goes to a times ri. And then the times row plus, which is ri goes to ri plus a times rj. Okay, notice also that all of these operations are reversible. That means so long as we stick to these operations, we're guaranteed to retain the solution to our system of equations. So we're not going to accidentally throw away one of the equations by doing these operations. So a quick, a quick couple of bits of terminology before we move on. So first off is the concept of row equivalent, equivalence. Sorry. We say that two matrices A and B are row equivalent if there exists a sequence of elementary row operations that takes A to B. So you can come up with a sequence of those operations we just talked about, swaps and scalar multiplications and times row pluses that gets A to B, then those two matrices are row equivalent. And then we can state our result about solutions being preserved a little more formally as the following theorem. Two systems of linear equations have the same solution set if and only if their augmented matrices are row equivalent. So this justifies us using these operations to try and attack a matrix and make it as simple as possible. So now we're ready to develop a method to reduce a matrix to a form where we can use back substitution or go into plan. So this method is called Gaussian elimination, named after Carl Friedrich Gauss. Um, so he was around in the late 18th to early 19th century, but the method itself was actually in use by the Chinese over 1800 years ago, so it's worth uh, keeping in mind. So the general strategy is we start with our matrix and we want to introduce zeros down each column in turn starting from the left. So we start on, the f on with the first column and we add multiples of the first row onto all the others to make zeros beneath that first entry. So you might need to do a row swap first to make sure that we have a non-zero entry in the 1-1 one, one position. Now while we're working on this first column, we don't really care what kind of mess we're creating, we're creating in the other columns, we'll just get to them and tidy them up later. So we'll start off with our example from last video. Um, so that's the matrix 1, 2, negative 1, 0, 3, 7, negative 6, 1, and negative 2, negative 2, negative 3, 1. So there is a 1 in the top left of the matrix, so we don't need to do any row swaps. So we're going to use our first row to clear zeros down the first column underneath. So we're going to add multiples of row 1 onto rows 2 and 3 to clear zeros beneath it. Now before we go on with the video, think about which two operations will achieve this. So row 2 is going to go to row 2 plus something times row 1, and row 3 is going to go to row 3 plus something times row 1 as well. So pause the video, see if you can figure out what those numbers should be before we move on. Okay, so let's do row 2 first. So I've got a 1 and a 3, so I want to take away 3 copies of row 1 from row 2 to get a 0 there instead. So it's going to be row 2 goes to row 2 minus 3 row 1. And so my new row 2 is going to be 3 minus 3 ones, that's the 0 we want. Then it's going to be 7 minus 3 twos, that gives me 1. Then it's going to be minus 6 minus 3 negative 1s. Here's the easiest place to make a mistake with all those negative signs. That's plus 3, which gives me minus 3 overall. And then I'll get 1 minus 3 zeros is still 1. Then looking at row 3 now, we need to add on 2 copies of row 1 to get that 0 in the left-hand entry of row 3. So that will give us negative uh, 2 plus 2 1s is 0. Then we've got negative 2 plus 2 twos. That gives us positive 2. Then we've got negative 3 plus 2 negative 1s, that's minus 5. And finally we've got 1 plus 2 zeros, which is still 1. So great, that worked nicely. We're now done with our first column. So what we're going to do next is to work on the second column. Now here's the catch. We don't want to add multiples of row 1 anymore, 
because this will mess up the zeros that we've already created. So we're going to add a multiple of row 2 to row 3 now to create the zero at the end of the second column. So again, pause the video and see if you can figure out which operation to do. Row 3 goes to row 3 plus something times row 2. Okay, so there's a 2 in row 3 that we want to get rid of, so we can get rid of that by subtracting off two copies of row 2. It's convenient that they're non-zero as a 1 again. So what I'll get in my new row 3 is 0. Notice how the, the 0 that's above it from row 2 doesn't touch the zeros; so that stays intact. Next entry along is 2 minus 2 lots of 1, which is 0, which is exactly what we wanted. And then we've got minus 5 minus 2 lots of minus 3. There's our big minus spaghetti again. That translates to adding 6, so that gives us 1, and then we get 1 minus 2 lots of 1 gives us negative 1. So by far the easiest mistake to make when we're doing these row operations is to mess up with negative signs. I'm really hoping I don't do one of those in these videos. <laughs> so just be slow and methodical. It's, best to, it's better not to make mistakes. Uh, so it's better to not make mistakes than it is to go fast and then go back and have to do it all over again. Okay, so after we've done all that, our system is now in upper triangular form and we can solve it by back substitution. So let's do it. Equation 3 now says that z equals minus 1. That's all we need. Equation 2 now says that y minus 3z equals 1, which means that y equals negative 2. And then equation 3 now says that x plus 2y minus z equals 0, which rearranges to x equals 3 when we plug those values of y and z, is, z in. So you can go back and check this by substituting those values into the original equations and check it still works. But that's all we need to do, we've solved our problem. So this one behaved nicely, but we should remain aware that it's possible that we might have no solution or that we might have infinitely many. Just, we've always got to keep remembering that. This is the, the, good, the best case scenario where everything works out nicely, not guaranteed to always work that way. Okay, so what might have gone wrong? Let's think about what happened here and what might have actually gone wrong for us. When we went down the first column, there wasn't a great deal that we could mess up. We might have had to swap rows to put something in the 1-1 one, one position if there wasn't already something there, but that's about it. What about when we got to column 2? Well, one thing that might have happened is that all the entries underneath row 1 might have been 0. Then we couldn't have put an entry into the 2-2 two, two position no matter what we did. So it turns out that this situation is actually quite possible, um, and that's what leads us to the no solution and the infinitely many solutions cases. So to cope with this, we need a more general version of the upper triangular form that we can get to no matter what. And this is called row echelon form. So imagine for a second that we've got a system of three equations and four unknowns. So just here's it represented by non-zeros. Does upper triangular form even exist here? The matrix isn't actually really the right shape, so there's no way we can make it into the form we had before. Uh, there are too many uh, variables for the number of equations. So the equivalent form is called the row echelon form, or sometimes just echelon form, and it looks a bit like this. Um, where the stars represent non-zeros. So here are a few examples of matrices in echelon form. They kind of look have that staircase structure of the upper triangular one, except that the stairs can be wide. You can jump across wise. Notice that there can be some zeros at the bottom. That's all fine as well, um, and that's what happens. So for row echelon form, it's quite easy to specify with a couple of rules. So first rule is that any full rows of zeros must be at the bottom of the matrix. And the second rule is that the first non-zero entry of each row from the left must have only zeros underneath it. Okay, so these first non-zero entries of each row, they're called leading entries. So if the matrix is an augmented matrix, then the variables associated with the leading entries are called pivot variables. If the constant term is a pivot, then we've got issues. More on this later. So when we're doing Gaussian elimination, we're actually targeting row echelon form, of which upper triangular is a special case. So let's practice on this one. We have a system of three equations and four variables. W minus X minus Y plus 2Z equals 1, etc, etc, etc. So we'll write it down as an augmented matrix and get started. So we can see a non-zero pivot in column 1 on the first row. So we don't need to do any row swaps and we're going to start there. So we'll do our two operations to get zeros beneath that 1. They will be row 2 goes to row 2 minus 2 row 1s. And row 3 goes to row 3 plus row 1. 
So working that through, we get the two new rows to be 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 1. I'll let you guys check this if you want to. And 0, 0, negative 5, 2, negative 2. Okay, so if we look at column 2 now, which is where we'd naturally want to go next, there's no pivot entry in the 2, 2 position, nor can we get one there by using a row swap. So we had to move across to the next column, which is column 3. There is a 1 in the 2, 3 position, so we'll now clear zeros down column 3 underneath that 1. So we're going to want to clear away that negative 5 from underneath our 1, and the row operation will therefore be row 3 goes to row 3 plus 5 row 2. Okay, so now if we just we are in row echelon form. Okay, there are no completely zero rows. If there were, they'd have to be at the bottom. And in each row, the leading entry has zeros beneath it. So row one has a leading entry in column one, and there are two zeros underneath that. Row two's leading entry is in column three. There is a zero underneath that. And row three's leading entry is at the bottom of the matrix. There don't need to worry about zeros underneath that one. Okay, so what do we do next? Well, I think we've gone long enough in this video, so that will be the subject of the next one. So a few words of advice before we finish. This is something that you just need to practice. Uh, it feels a little bit awkward and unfamiliar at first, but actually these, these row operations are quite a mechanical, predictable procedure, and you can get quite good at them just by doing some practice. So once you've got a few repetitions under your belt, it becomes something that you know how to do automatically. And then ultimately, of course, we actually want a computer to do a job like this for us because computers actually are much better at accurately manipulating tables of numbers than we are. But it's really important that we understand what's going on before we're allowed to have the luxury of letting computers solve these problems for us. Okay, so that's enough for one night. Uh, we will see you in the next one. Kakite anō.